Hey, this is Todd Henson, and first thing I want to say is thank you for joining. You're about to see a uh, event I did at the Alliance Rally. Now, the information that I have here is just one hour of what you would get over here at the National RV Training Academy. So sit back, relax, let's go ahead and watch it, and if it's something you like, keep in mind that you can get that information here at the National RV Training Academy. We'll see you then. All right, so I, there was this, you know, unfair promise that I'm going to teach you electrical in one hour. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, if you don't mind, is I'm just basically going to give you the first hour of what we have in our fundamentals training. Okay, so that way um, you guys get a taste of this. Now, I will say this, I, I am tailoring this to you because, of course, in order to understand electricity, if you have no knowledge of electricity, your takeaway today my goal is to show you a little bit about consumption, right? In the RV space, we have limited amount of electricity and we, end, we need to understand how much can we use, when can we use it. So in order to do that, we're just gonna go over a few little things. We're gonna be talking about Watt's Law. I'm just gonna teach you volts, amps, and watts and how to actually look at your consumption. So um, if you're here thinking of it, I was gonna go over something like, um, uh, I don't know, capacitive, uh, loads or something like that, see me afterwards. I'll be more than happy to talk to you. I love talking to electrical engineers who think they know everything and then they find out, hey, some of us know something. So I'm just picking on you guys. Any electrical engineers in here? No I've just. <laughs> so I'm safe. Now I will say this in the RV experience, how many of you imagined RVing exactly as what you actually? Um, uh, actually, uh, I, I guess, uh, C, right? You, you imagine you're chasing the dream, you go out, you buy your RV, and it's exactly as you thought. Any one of you. No, so what we're gonna do is, what we do in our classes and everything else, I know that everyone comes in, they come in with a different level of knowledge specific to their RV, but we all come in with some great knowledge in other industries, everything else, and so what we do is we always look at taking whatever islands of knowledge you guys have and bridge those. But tell me if I'm wrong that in the RV space, whenever you started getting into RVing, you started figuring out there was a few quirks, right? And you just can't figure out what that quirk is. Now we call that a purple monkey, right? Now a purple monkey is nothing more than a big hairy problem that seems to have no answer due to a lack of evidence or a distortion of the facts. I think one that we've all dealt with, of course, is let's say backing up our RV into an RV site. Now, I don't know when I first got into this about uh, eight years ago, I said, I will never back into a, spite, a site. I will just pay for a pull through, <laughs> right? Now, how many of you know what I'm talking about, right? When you're backing that RV in, you know, you think you should know how to do it, right? Put this here, okay? Going backwards, you take your wheel, you turn it to the right, things turn left then you have someone who helps you, right? And it's a different language, right? Turn right, turn right. Me turn right, do you want the truck to turn right or do you want the trailer to turn right? Now, one of the best things that I love doing, I actually one of the, I watch YouTube a lot because as RVers, we really don't have local channels, so we go watch YouTube, right? You know one thing better than that? Watching you guys pull into an RV site. Oh man, that is fun. Right? Now, how many of you have been RVing for more than a couple years? All right? For you, maybe old hat, right? But for the new people, it's kind of fun, right? You want to watch someone else struggle. You know? <laughs> All right, so we're not the only ones. See, hon? Right? Now, for you new RVers, part of that is, is whenever you do it, you want to be nice. So you're just looking through the blinds, kind of pulling back the blinds, hoping they don't see you. For the rest of us who's been doing it for a while, we don't care. We open up the lawn chair, we sit out the lawn chair, open up a beer. <laughs> Just wave at everyone. You're going to back that in. All right, so that's a purple monkey, right? You think you should know how to do it, and you simply can't. Even more fun to watch whenever people have phones or walkie-talkies, and they're still yelling at each other. <laughs> well, in the RV space, we kind of learned it's kind of the same thing, right? We, we've worked on our houses, everything else, and then we get into our RV, and it is different. And especially when it comes to electrical. Okay, I know for many of us, we feel that you know, electricity is just something 
you know, I, I get it all the time. Hey, Todd, I want to take this, but you know, electrical is my kryptonite. So what I want to do is I want to reveal some of the stuff. Okay, because honestly, you know, as electricians, anything else, we're not that smart. Okay, we learn a couple formulas, we learn how to do this, and we just kind of keep it straight. So what I want to do is I just want to go over some of the variables that we have when we're talking electricity, okay? <coughs> this is the last time I'm calling about this warranty, and if you don't answer, I'm going to call from another number. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but every single RV out there has three different electrical systems, okay? three different electrical systems, okay? In there, we have our chassis voltage. Now, someone help me out. What does chassis voltage mean? What does chassis mean? Your frame. Frame, motor and frame, right? So I want you guys to think of your starter battery inside your vehicle, right? What does that battery run? What does that battery operate inside your vehicle? Well, it starts the starter, right? Runs the lights, ignition. We call it an SLI battery, starter lights and ignition. All right, so that's the first form of electrical that we have inside the RV. Now, even your towables, we all have a starter battery. All right, we all have our coach battery. We'll get into that a little bit differently. And then of course, we'll get into what we call our bricks and sticks, which is 120 volts. Now, do you all agree that all RVs have a starter battery? You're looking at me not giving an answer at all. <laughs> You're like, Todd, I want to obviously say no because I have a towable. This is an alliance rally. They do not do motorized. But your towable still has a starter battery. Yep. Right? How do we connect a starter battery to our towable? Okay. Through that seven pin connector. Right, so we have a seven pin connector. Now, again, what does it run for us? The starter batteries, what does it run for us? Lights. Brakes, ah, electric wheel brakes. All right, now how many of you, uh, you have a real truck? <laughs> no one wants to raise their hand. You have a Ford. Yes. Yeah. All right. I did, I didn't say a toy. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have a RAM? No one is raising their hands. This is awesome. All right, so you have your seven pin connector. Did you know that those running lights, the electric wheel brakes, everything else does not even communicate with any other of our systems, right? So it does not communicate with our systems. It's kind of funny because when you go to rallies, everything else, they'll have that unit sitting out there and you see the running lights just flashing and you wonder, man, I'd like to do that. How do they do that? But you have your starter battery and it's just running again, your electric wheel brakes, your running lights, your marker lights. So let me ask you this, just thinking about this, because I know it has happened to you. You fall asleep driving, <laughs> you wake up, there's a unit in front of you and you see amber lights. Is that RV or whatever it is, vehicle coming towards you or is it going the same direction you're going? Amber, it's going right amber is coming towards you. Right. Again, fall asleep again, you wake up and you have red lights in front of you. It's going away from you. It's going the same direction. Now you're saying it's going away from you. Now if those red lights are on, it's going slower than you are. Right. Bright red lights. So you hit your brakes. Now when you hit your brakes, which battery are you using? You're, you're, oh, so the Fords, you guys are saying the truck battery. Waiting for the Rams to go, well, we're using the Ram battery. <laughs> Peterbilt, okay. All right, so you have a different set of electrical there. It is just gonna be for our um, starter battery. Now, let's jump over to our coach battery. What does our coach battery run? All right, so we have lights. What else? You can say everything 12 volts. There we go. Lights, furnace, water pump. Possibly a refrigerator. Ignition. Okay. What? Ignition. Okay. Ah, no, that's a piezo lighter. A little bit different. Well, so they do make one. They do make one that is 12 volts. The starter. All right. So let's let's cover this. 
I'm going to say this, that 12 volts in your RV, that's the brains. It tells everything else what to do. The 120 volts, that's the brawn. This is how I want you guys to imagine this. In your RV, we do have our starter battery that's going to be our running lights, our brakes, everything else. Beyond that, our coach battery is the brains to everything else. Point in case, your air conditioner. Air conditioner is kind of big. What do you think that runs off of? 12 volts or 120 volts? 120. What tells the air conditioner what to do? 12 volts. All right, every single thermostat that we touch, anything that we interact with is 12 volts. So I want you to understand that your 12 volts is the brains of the operation, 120 volts, typically not so smart. Oh, you want me to turn the motor? Okay, I turn the motor. All right, so I want you to get that you know, through so we, we can begin to understand this because I always see, there's, I always get confusion when people come up and they say, Todd, I'm running off my generator and it runs everything but the air conditioner. What do you mean everything? Well, it's running the lights. You know, I've got the fan on and it's running, but I can't turn the air conditioner on. All right, well, your generator is 120 volts, yeah? Your lights are 12 volts. <coughs> so we're going to start putting this together as we go through here. So your 12 volts is going to be your brains, except for in two areas. What two areas do we use 12 volts, our battery, in order to move heavy loads? Our slides, so our hydraulics, so that would be our slides. Landing gear, our leveling system. Those are going to use a lot of amperage, and we'll get into that, right? But that puts a lot of tax on our battery. So I want to pose this question, and I'll ask for the answer at the end of the hour, okay? Because it does happen quite a bit. You've been traveling all day, and so let's say your battery is dead. You've been traveling all day. You get to your site, and I know that this happens, right? You get parts into your site. After about 60, 30, you know, 60 million turns, you finally get this set up. You go to hit your landing gear, and your landing gear goes down just a bit until it touches the bottom. And as soon as it touches the bottom, I've got no weight on it, right? It just simply stops. What do you do? <laughs> He's heard it this last time as well. He knows what to do, too. <laughs> right? Leave a voicemail, and the voicemail's full. All right, so what do you do? Here's the situation. Everything is working just fine, but your battery is dead. Okay, you're trying to get your landing gear down. The question is, is how do you get it down? You've been traveling all day, everything else. Let me ask you this. When you're plugged into your truck or ram, <laughs> are you charging that coach battery as you're going down the road? What charges that coach battery? Just barely, just barely which is true, just barely. Right? Well, that'd be your alternator, correct? All right. So when you're stayed plugged in, you've got a dead battery. It does happen, right? You have a dead battery. You're still plugged in, and you still can't get your landing gear down. If you can't get your landing gear down, you can't get your slides out. All you want to do is go inside and turn on the air conditioner. <laughs> what do you do? Do you sit there and wait? Jump it. Jump it. Okay. So how do you jump it if you're still connected to your truck? Long jumper cables. Long jumper cables. <laughs> All right, so I'm getting plug it in. Now, wait a minute. When you plug in your RV, are you plugging into 12 volts, uh, coach voltage, starter voltage, or what are we plugging into? 120. Well, what does 120 have to do with 12 volts? Well, I thought that was moving for a second. I felt the vibration. I said, oh, it's sliding off. Converter. Y'all are saying converter. What does a converter do? It converts AC to DC. Takes voltage 110 down to 12. So it's basically a battery charger. <coughs> Correct? So let me set the situation for you. You're still plugged into your truck. Still got your seven pin connector. So the alternator is charging that dead battery. You go ahead and plug into shore power. Converter is now charging that battery. You assume between the two, you're still gonna get your landing gear down, and guess what? You do not. You see that battery is dead. Okay? What do you do? Pull out your jump box. Pull out your jump box. 
All right. The goal for this is to learn how things work so that way you can go ahead and take care of it without spending too much money, right? And there's something that we can do that doesn't cost anything. Now, I know by the looks of it, you know, that you see me and you say, Todd, he's very active. He doesn't mind doing a lot of work. But what I love to do is be lazy. <laughs> how many of you know that the best worker you can ever hire if you're trying to figure out a, a difficult situation, is hire the laziest person ever. Because they will find a way to make it super easy. All right, so the goal of this is to teach you how to actually get past that by being smart and being lazy, okay? Now, so I'm just gonna pose that question, we'll come back, right? You have everything plugged in, you're charging, battery's taking a charge, but there's still not enough to get that landing gear down. Okay, so just want y'all to think about that. By the end of this course, maybe we'll have something there. All right, so I first asked you, of course, we have our seven pin connector, and I asked you guys, okay, if your starter battery is on, or you have your alternator on, is it charging your coach battery? You all said yes. You all said yes. All right, so let me ask you this. We also know that that starter battery runs our brakes, as long as we're plugged in. What should happen with our fifth wheel, God forbid, if we actually become unattached from our truck? Brakes should come on. The brakes should, well, wait a minute. The brakes should come on, but you just said, Todd, that it's the chassis battery that runs the brakes. If I come disconnected from the truck, how can the brakes come on if I'm disconnected from the truck? Your brake battery. Your brake battery. <laughs> Say, say, say again. Breakaway, Breakaway switch. All right. Do you know your RV has a lot of switches on it, right? A lot of switches. Do switches go bad? Yep. Do you think there's more than one type of switch out there? Okay. <laughs> well, we'll put them in three different categories. All right. So, of course, we have switches. And in the RV space, we have tons of switches. And if we know how switches work, we can also fix some problems. All right, so we have that breakaway switch. God forbid, should you come just attached? Now, in the South, we, we don't call it a breakaway switch. We call it a Jesus switch. <laughs> you come disconnected, what are you going to say? Help me, Jesus. Jesus, take the RV. <laughs> right. Well, what happens is that switch is doing something for us. What do you think that switch is doing? All right, so when we're connected to the RV with our truck, of course, I have a switch there. Now, this switch allows me to run power from the chassis battery. Once that switch is activated, it switches course and is no longer pulling it from the chassis battery, it's pulling it from the coach battery. Now, how can a switch do that? Say again. It just switches, Todd. That's how it works. I don't need to know how technically a light switch works on and off. That's what it says. Turn it on, it's on. Turn it off, it's off. All right. Well, and this is where we got to get to, of course, as we're going through all this. You need to understand that we have different switches in the RV and they do different things. And if we can understand just a little bit about how that works, then, of course, whenever we do have a problem, it's easier for us to identify, easier for us to fix, okay? So I don't want to stay on switches too long since I was promised, or it wasn't me, but was promised that we talk about electrical, okay? But you do have that switch on there. How many of you have actually just pulled your breakaway switch because you think, if you're sitting on a slope, that if you pull that breakaway switch, the brakes are going to help your RV stay on that slope? Good. All right, any first time RVers in here? How many of you are afraid to raise your hand on this question? <laughs> like, no one else is raising their hand. Obviously, we don't do that. Okay, it's like, how many of you have your awning out while it's raining? <laughs> Honey, no one else has their awning out. Should we bring it in? All right? If you're the only one with your awning out, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> All other RVs know something you don't. All right, so. Just 
without getting in it too much, okay, we want to make sure that we are not using that as a brake system, okay? It's only for emergency. All right, so we're just establishing this. In order for us to understand electrical, there's a few things that are going on. Let's get into some of the electrical things that we need to talk about. All right, so with our three electrical systems here, we just covered this. I think we're on what chassis? Yeah, coach voltage here. That's our interior lights, our water system. Now, how does 12 volts help our water? Why do we have 12 volts hooked up to water in the first place? Okay, so let's add, we have RVs, we have water. Where do we contain our water? In a tank. In a tank. And where are the tanks located? In the frame. Below the floor. Okay, so when we want to flush the toilet, where's our toilets usually located? Above the floor, right? And if it's not, this is whenever you call Fenacci, right? My toilet seems to be below the frame. I think I have a problem. How do we get the water from our holding tanks up to, say, our toilet? Water pump. 12 volts. Okay, so if we have the 12 volts is there to help out, of course, move the water whenever we need to use it. Okay, so on here, we're just looking at the different things that we have with our coach. I'm trying to speed through this so we can get over here so I can give you something that is going to be a good takeaway. Okay, now I will tell you the slide outs and leveling system, those are going to be the two things that draw a lot of power from our batteries. Okay, and those batteries need to be at full voltage before we can use them. A lot of stuff we can get away with the smaller things, but when we get to our batteries, when we get to our, I'm sorry, our slide outs and our landing gear, that's when we need to have full voltage. All right, so here, do I have coach voltage twice? Sure do. All right. Since I've been using the word voltage, let's get into understanding a little bit about electrical. In order to understand electrical, we have some of the variables. The first variable that we're going to cover is volts. Now, volts, I'm going to give it another name. It's pressure. It's pressure. Now, when we're talking about electricity, what we're doing is we're just simply moving electrons from point A to point B. We're using electrons. Did you know that electrons actually have a weight to them? And they actually take up space. I know it's hard for us to see, right? So typically, whenever we see someone talking about electricity, we always equate it to water, right? So let's think of water. I have it in a water hose. I need to move that water from point A to point B. I open up the hose bib. When I open up the hose bib, there's pressure on one side of that hose bib, right? As soon as I open up the faucet, water can be pushed out. So we're talking voltage. Voltage is another word for pressure. The amount of pressure that we can move those electrons. Now in the RV space, what two forms of pressure do we typically use? 12 volt and 120. 12 volt and 120, thank you. 12 volt and 120. All right, the lower the pressure, right, then the lower amount of electrons we can actually move, the higher the pressure, more electrons. All right, I want to equate it to a standard vehicle. How many of you had a standard growing up? How many of you are young and don't know what a standard vehicle is? <laughs> Did anyone ever have to push start their vehicle? Oh, yeah. All right, so let me equate voltage to whoever is pushing your car. Now, my first car was a 79 Mustang. Thought it was a chick magnet, so that's why I bought it. I was 16, right? It did not have a starter, but I did not care. It was a Mustang. Now, those of you that know Mustang, what do you know about the 79? It's not a chick magnet. It was a four-cylinder engine. It was the Pinto, just with a different horse's name. Right? <laughs> But it did have that front scoop, and that's what I wanted. So I bought this, and I did not have a starter. I didn't care because I knew I could push start it. Now, growing up, I was about 20 miles away from high school. So in order for me, I had to choose. You know, I, could, I, wanted, to, I wanted to drive my car because I didn't want to take that bus. I'm 16. I'm an adult. I should be driving myself to school. And I cannot, you know, have a girlfriend if I'm riding the bus. Now, in order for me to take my car, what else did I have to take with me? Friends, right? <laughs> friends. Now, if I only had one friend, I want to equate that one friend to 12 volts, low voltage. Hey, in order for us to get to school, you have to push it. 
What's the hardest part of pushing a car? Well, the one actually pushing and not the one that's <laughs> popping the clutch. Right, push starting, right? Getting it started. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest, right? Once we get it rolling, then it was somewhat easy. So if I had one person pushing it, I want you to equate that to 12 volts, right? One person pushing it. If I had four or five people pushing it, okay? Four or five people pushing it, a little, little bit easier, correct? Now by doing that, I want you to equate that to 120 volts. When we're talking voltage, we're talking pressure. The amount of pressure we're pushing these electrons, okay? Now on here, you'll see that we have that there. You ever wonder why we use the term volts? It, it, isn't it so much easier if we just understand that when we're saying volts, we're actually just saying pressure? Why don't they call it pressure? Does anyone have an idea why we called it volts? Mr. Voltaire, Mr. Voltaire right? Now that Voltaire was, an, uh, was a writer, right? He actually wrote books. But no, it's, it's the last name of an engineer. What do we know about engineers? <laughs> You're all laughing. <laughs> Engineers are pretty smart, right? They are. I'm not saying engineers are very smart. How do I know that they're smart? Because they let you know that they're smart. This is also what we know about engineers. I mean, I will say this. I mean, engineers are very smart, and the world goes around because of engineers, right? And if they find something new, what do you think they do with that? Knowledge. They name it after themselves, okay? They will name it after themselves, okay? Now, if a farmer creates something, how do they name things? Based on what it does. Now, this is just a little, just a little tidbit of information for you. From here on out, if you buy a product and the product name is named after what it does, then you know that a farmer or a layperson made it. If it comes with a weird name, it's named after somebody. More than likely an engineer. Don't know his first name, so it's Dude Volts. All right, pressure. Understanding, hey, we're moving these electrons, we need a certain amount of pressure. In the RV space, we either use 12 volts or 120 volts. We tracking so far? All right, that's the first section here. Next one is amperage. Amperage. Again, we're talking about these electrons. We're moving these electrons from point A to point B, okay? Now, what does amperage quantify for us? Volume. Volume, Volume of what? Electrons. Of electrons, right? How many electrons are actually moving, all right? So if I have more amperage, I have more electrons, okay? More electrons also makes it harder for pressure. All right, so I want you to think of amperage like this. How many grew up and you were a sack person? Sack boy, sack girl, whatever, a grocery store. At the end of the shift, what did you always have to do? Go pick up those buggies, right? Shopping carts. One shopping cart equates, say, to one amp. Multiple short, uh, shopping carts, multiple amps, right? Now, how many of you watch the kids today use the little machines to get those shopping carts? They do not understand struggle. <laughs> Right? How many of you are kind of jealous, like, I want to get back into this game because that sure does look fun, right? Okay, so because electrons cannot be seen, I want you to think of them like the shopping carts. The more electrons we use, the more amperage we use, of course, then the more buggies we have. And the more buggies we have, we need to make sure we have enough pressure. Do you think length, you know, from distance from one, one, from one section of our RV to another section, do you think that's a lot when it comes to us moving these electrons to do things? Okay. 12 volts it is, right? You don't want to do a heavy load on that. So amperage, I want you to understand, is the amount of electrons. The amount of electrons that we're using. You see, because all of this stuff, what we're getting to is, is that your RV, anything electrical has some type of data plate on there. And that data plate's gonna give you some information. It'll give you your volts, and it'll give you your amps. What you need to understand is that electrons, electricity, they take up space and they have a weight to them, okay? And all we're doing is quantifying them. All right, where do you think we get the word amperage from? Yeah, dude amper. Dude amper, right? Another guy that came up with this stuff. All right.
Now, so I want you to do this. This is class participation. You've been sitting around for a while. At the, RV, the National RV Training Academy, we're all about trying to do as much hands-on as possible. So everyone follow me, and I want you to put your arms in an X. Put them up in front of you. There we go. Okay, man, some of you just look so, like, irritated at this point. <laughs> all right, so here's your first formula. Volts times amps equals watts. So hold your hands up like you're doing. Now, as you're doing this, do you see the V? Yes? Do you see the A? Some of you aren't answering, and I'm going to make you guys hold your hands up like Ben-Hur until you get an answer. See, the warranty's calling over here now. Okay, you put your hands down now. When we're talking about electricity, we need to understand that we're quantifying the electricity, we're quantifying the amount of use that we're using, and we're using those two different variables right there, volts and amps. Now, I said that volts times amps equals watts, right? How many of you know, you don't know anything else, but you know the wattage of, say, your microwave or anything else like that? Some of you do. How many of you know the wattage of your Keurig coffee maker? You know how to what? Look on the sticker on the back, right? The data plate. All right, so now we're starting to put this together. Okay, now one more thing. Let's look at watts, and I'm going to tell a little story. Okay, now watts equals volts times amps, or it's actually uh, the relationship between volts and amps. How much power can we actually use, or how much work can we perform? Okay, how much work can you perform? All right, so I want you guys to look at this picture up here, right? I've got, you know, when we're talking wattage, we're talking, you know, a, kind of like a water tower. Now, how many of you know what a water tower does for us? Some of you raise your hands, some of you just give answers. I haven't really, I haven't really told you how to respond. Yes, go ahead. I'll get your hand up. Yes, sir. Head pressure. Yes. Thank you. I don't know what to do with that. Five pounds to every 10 foot of elevation. Does water have a weight to it? Yes. Roughly about 8.35 pounds per gallon, right? Now here's the thing. All right, so when we're looking at, of course, consumption, right? We have in our RV, we have a water pump. Can we have a greater demand than maybe what the water pump can provide for us? Yes. Right, you learn that the hard way. When you're the one in the shower, <laughs> Now then someone else opens up a faucet, right? Also the pressure goes down and so does the temperature. The temperature totally changes, right? Well, okay, so I want you to put this on a grand scale. The reason why we have water towers, all municipalities, right? We get our water from the city. Did you know the city has water pumps? Did you know there's two times a day that in a municipality that we demand more water than even what the city pumps can provide? What two times a day is that? Morning and evening, like there's any other time of day, if you put it that way. What's going on in the morning? You're taking showers, right? That's a lot of water, right? A lot of volume. In the evening, typically, what may be taking place? <coughs> Washing clothes, everything else, right? So there's two times a day that we're actually having a greater demand than what can be supplied by those pumps. Well, what they do is they understand that water, having weight, wants to go to the ground. Well, they take that water, they hold it up in the air. Okay, where does water want to go when it's held up in the air? Down. Down. So they take a couple thousand gallons, stick it up in a you know, tower, and what they'll do is they'll pl plug that in line with our water lines. When the pressure goes down, what takes over? Gravity, right? Water tower, gravity, okay. So we got that, right? Do you understand when we're always talking about electricity, you always see that we're always using water to you know, give us some examples. So, when you look at a water tower, does that make sense now? That when you look at a water tower, do you think watts? You're thinking power. Yes? <laughs> I got some skeptics. All right, so let me tell you a story. Now, I was trained under Terry Cooper, who happens to be my father-in-law. Okay, he's been teaching, um, I guess, uh, for people to become technicians for nearly 30 years now. So he used to teach at TSTC College in Waco, Texas. Okay, it's a little, about an hour and a half, two hours south of Dallas, Texas. For those of you who aren't living right, don't understand where Texas is. 
All right, so he used to teach at TSTC College, which happens to be right across the street from an airport. And he taught it about the same time that we had President George W. Bush in office. Now, George W. Bush had a ranch in Crawford, Texas. So guess where he would land whenever he went to his ranch? Waco. At this airport in Waco, Texas. Now, Cooper, always teaching, um, of course, technicians. His classes were always after lunch. Every single day, as he's walking to class, he would get a call from the dean. All right? Hey, can you tell your guys to knock it off? Right? They're waiting for the doors to open. What do you got a bunch of 19, 20, 21 year olds? They've been sitting out there for lunch. What do you think they're doing at this point when they're done with lunch? Turning on their stereos, right? Making it really loud. Every single day, Cooper would get a call from the dean. Hey, can you tell you guys to knock it off? The rest of the students out there are trying to learn something, right? And they're getting, they're disturbing them. One day he walks up to his class and doesn't get a call from the dean. Not only that, but he looks out and every single one of his students is sitting down, not saying a word. Does this seem like normal behavior for a bunch of 19 year olds? No. So of course he asks the question, hey guys, what's going on? Silence, nothing. After a while, finally the squealer. So Mr. Cooper, what had happened was, and he began to tell a story. This is how that story went. He says, Cooper, we were doing nothing. Mr. Cooper, we were doing nothing but minding our own business, right? We have these canisters over here and we're just sitting standing on them. Now here's what's going on. They knew that Air Force One was landing, right? They wanted to get a bird's eye view of Air Force One landing. Now, the school happened to be just adjacent to this airport. And the thing that was in between them was a fence. And the fence was actually, uh, what you call it, wooden, so you can't see through there. So what they did is they jumped on the containers to look over the fence. Right? Got their music playing, everything else, waiting for Air Force One to land, because that'd be kind of cool to watch. Well, after a while, right, before everything lands, after a while, on the other side of the fence, a black SUV drives up to them. A gentleman in a suit gets out and very cordial says, gentlemen, I need you to get off that container. Now, put yourself in your, you know, this, gen this gentleman's shoes. You're just one individual and you're telling a bunch of 19, 20, 21 year olds what to do. How do you think that would go? Please get off the container. Nope. Sir, we're not bothering you. We're going to stay up here. We're waiting for our instructor, and then we'll get down. But we want to watch Air Force One. Back and forth for about five minutes. Right? After a while, now all of a sudden the kids own the canister, right? You can't tell us what to do. We own this. You ever notice that like with your own kids? This is my home. You're like, when did you make a payment? <laughs> your home. After a while, he cannot get them down. So what he does is, all right, let me get your attention. You guys see that water tower right over here? I want you to look at this water tower. And about that time, he reaches over, has a little CB, and says, go ahead and show him. Look over here. About that time, a black silhouette stands up, holds a rifle, <laughs> and begins to wave it. <laughs> what do you think those kids did? They got down. All right, so what was going on on top of that water tower? There was a sniper. The pressure. <laughs> there was pressure. <laughs> we were applying pressure, Todd, and getting those kids up. Right. Now, there was, there was a, a, a sniper up there. In the event that someone tried to do something, that sniper was there to take care of the president. To this day, I still don't understand why that sniper wanted the kids off the container. Because if he missed, do we think that fence was going to slow anything down? Probably not. All right. So which one of the two gentlemen had the power to get those kids off the container? The guy in the black SUV or the guy on the water tower? Water tower. Water tower. All right. Now in your RV travels, every time you go by an RV, I mean, every time you go by a water tower, what are you going to think? Sniper. Power. <laughs> you're thinking power. All right? Since we're talking about electricity, you're thinking power, not sniper. Some of you may want to look at that to see. All right. So I've given you the formula. Volts times amps equals watts, right? So here we have it right here. I want you guys to understand that we have limited power coming into our RV. Our outlets, just for point in case. What, what amperage are our outlets in our RV? 
15 amps. For those of you who don't know, it's 15 amps. Okay, now if I give you the formula volts times amps equals watts, we know that our outlets have 15 amps to them. We also know that it's 120 volts. And we'll just use the, you know, that number there, 120 volts. How many watts could we get out of our single outlet that we have? What's the maximum potential watts that we can get? So that'd be 120 volts times 15 amps equals uh, eight. <laughs> 1,800 watts. 1,800 watts. Okay. Exactly. That's what we're getting to. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's a, it's, a, it's a reality check for us, right? Now, here's the thing. Do we think that in our RV that each outlet has its own... <laughs> 15 amp breaker no, no. now if i ask you to go over to your rv and look at your breaker panel box open that up you may find two possibly three 15 amp breakers now one of those we know is going to be set up just for a gfci what does gfci stand for ground, ground fault circuit interrupter okay todd you give me the title but what does it do for us what is the gfci for Keeps you alive. It protects the human, typically from what? From getting shocked. <laughs> well, if we're around water sources, right? All right, so the NEC tells us that we need to be GFCI protected anywhere within six foot of water. So I think we can all learn as RVers where do we have GFCI protection? Bathrooms, kitchen, outdoors. There you go. Bathrooms, kitchen, outdoors. Well, that's its own circuit, okay? We, if, we're, if we're lucky, we have two more circuits. We understand now that we have a you know, 120 volt outlet, 15 amp rated. Now I want you to go home to your RV today and count how many outlets you have. <coughs> and you have one or two circuits. So what does that mean? Can we run a hair dryer and say a coffee pot at the same time if it's on the same circuit? No. Okay. Now, if it's in the kitchen, you run your coffee pot, yay, it's on a GFCI, so it's probably on its own circuit. But if you're in the bathroom running a hairdryer, you can't. Does that mean we can't run both at once no matter what? No. What does that mean for us? What can we do? <laughs> can't get more than 15 amps to that outlet. Go to another outlet. There we go. Right? Well, let's put it this way, because hair dryer is no fun, right? Now, how many of you learned, you know, that you're cooking, you buy a little stove or something, a little portable stove or something like that, right? And you just plug that in. So let's just go with, you know, the necessities when it comes to RVing. Eating bacon and drinking coffee. <laughs> What's that? Keeping beer cold. Keeping beer cold. Well, I, I've even got to work around for that. You don't want beer to get warm, so you just drink that as you're driving. <laughs> Okay. But only in the stop sign. That way you're not breaking your gravity. All right. So let's say you're, you're cooking, you know, your bacon, right? And you've got a, say, a George Foreman grill. I want you to learn that everything that when we're producing heat or we're creating heat, hair dryer, making coffee, cooking bacon, anything where we're producing heat, we're using a lot of wattage. A lot of wattage. Typically anywhere between 1,200, 1,500 watts. If I'm using, a, say, a 1,500-watt little stove or a little, little cooktop grill, 1,500 watts, how much do I have left in that whole circuit? 300 watts. 300 watts. Can I run a hair dryer? No. Can I run a coffee pot? All right. But if I can find another outlet, and typically the bedroom has a separate circuit, all you have to do is choose which one are you going to put in the bedroom. Now I want you to think about this because you may have a wonderful day whether you choose to do this or if you take it somewhere else. Do you think your one plus, your spouse, whomever, they would be offended to wake up to the smell of coffee in the bedroom? Probably not. No, they would be offended? Okay. <laughs> Well, this story no longer flies. You're the first person that ever said, no, I would be offended if I smelled coffee. Would you be offended if you smelled bacon? Probably not. All right. 
Now you have a choice. <laughs> All right. I, what I want you to do is just become aware of your power consumption, and I want you to understand that your outlets are only 15 amp rated. Now, 15 amps equals 1,800 watts. Whether you understand amps or whether you understand watts, what will happen is, is you begin to look at, okay, what can I run, what can I not run? And unfortunately, most of the stuff in the kitchen is going to be between that 12 and 1,500 watts. So no, you can't do something in the kitchen at the same time that you're doing something in the bathroom. Because typically in the bathroom, if you are using that outlet, it's again to produce heat. Whether it be a curling iron, a hair dryer, whatever there may be. Okay? Does that take away from our RVing experience? No. All we have to do is just think and say, okay, well, I can't use that. Is there another place where I can do that? Or do I wait until maybe the coffee is done? Unplug the washing machine. Now, that's typically it's going to be on its own circuit as well. Typically, it will be on its own circuit. Now, do you know what else is also on its own circuit in your kitchen? Microwave. Microwave is on its own circuit. Okay. Now, you got to decide, do I microwave my bacon? Who are you? <laughs> all right. So if you can get to it, that is another circuit, right? So all right. Now, with the Alliance, most of our rigs are what? What rated? 50 amp, 30 amp, 15 amp. What are we rated in total in the RV? 50. All right. So just a little pop quiz. How many potential watts can we use in our 50 amp rig? If we were to turn on everything, or if we, if we had the potential to, what's our total watts? Oh, I got two different answers. 12,000 and 6,000. 50 times 120 is 6,000, right? But our 50 amp service is two hot legs. So 50 amps on one leg, 50 amps on another leg. So we have a potential of 12,000 watts. Now, just as an FYI, in your house, we all have a house, right? At some point, we all had a house. What was our potential wattage in our house? 200 times 2 times 120. 48,000 watts. 48,000 watts. I mean, now that, here's what I'm getting at. You're used to, in your house, a potential of upwards of 48,000 watts. Get to a 50 amp service, which is still pretty darn good, 12,000 watts. But our outlets, 1,800 watts. Okay? If we can understand just consumption, right? Just some consumption information. Okay, hey, it's, we get this all the time. Why are my breakers tripping? Why are my breakers tripping? Well, you're doing two things at once. You need to understand either we need to change the circuit, you know, go somewhere else, or just change the timing on when we're doing something, okay? And then in our experience, when it comes to being out there, we hate it when breakers trip. We wonder what's going on. And the more we trip them, the weaker they get is just understand, okay, can I turn this on at the same time I can turn that on? Well, yes or no. Well, I can look at the data plate, figure out whether I can or not, okay? Now, I think I still have some time. I, do I, yeah, ooh, 51 minutes, I got nine minutes. I wanted just to give you that brief information. One thing I always try and leave time for is questions. I have canned information that I go over on something like this. In our classes, I do the same exact thing, and that is ask, what, what, what questions do you have regarding electricity that is preventing you from having a wonderful RV experience? So does anyone have questions when it comes to electricity? All right, so can I get you to yell loud enough or do I have to walk you up? You're shaking your head no, I don't know what that means. Okay, yes sir. Uh-huh. Okay, so, well, um, let, me, let me see if I can get which question you're asking. So you have an inverter. Now, what does an inverter do? It converts 12 volts to 120. It takes, yeah, DC to AC, so it takes 12 volts and invents 120 volts. All right, so I'm just gonna use the word invents instead of convert. What does convert typically mean? To step down, right? So here we're inverting, so we're taking 12 volts and we're creating 120 volts. And you're saying, hey, Todd, nothing in this world is free. 
How do I go from 12 to 120? Well, I'm using my amps to do it. It takes 10 times the amps in order to create 120 volts. Okay, so you have a battery. Your battery um, tells you you have 100 amp hours at 12 volts. Well, if I take that same battery, run it through an inverter, and it takes 10 times the amperage to go from 12 volts to 120. Volts times amps equals watts, okay? If I increase the volts, I can decrease the amps. But if I um, decrease the volts, then I have to increase the amps, right? All right, so if I go from 12 volts to 120 volts, it takes 10 times the amps, I have a battery that's rated at 100 amp hours at 12 volts. What's, what is that battery rated at at 120 volts? 10 amp hours or 10 amps. So now I look at my device. What do I want to run? And then I look at the amperage. Let's say it's going to be your Keurig coffee maker. We've done the numbers. We said it's 1,200 watts. We divide that by 120. We've got roughly 10 amps. So how long can I run that Keurig coffee pot through an inverter off of one battery? One hour. Right? All we're doing is just looking at the numbers and bringing that back. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Did I ever tell you no? I got a couple minutes to do it. All right, so this is what we need to know. All right? Now, in class, you'll learn um, in order to understand electricity, you have to understand men. And if you can understand men, you can understand electricity. There's your answer. All right. Electrons, in order for us to move electricity, they don't want to do any work for us unless we guarantee a couple things for them. First thing is, is they want to go back to the source. All we're doing is we're taking these electrons, they have a negative charge. We're stealing that charge from them. They said, hey, go over to this load, take care of that load, right? And they said, well, in order for us to do that, you need to give us a path home. So in electricity, 12 volts, we have our positive side, we have our negative side. 120 volts, we have our hot, and we have our neutral. In all cases, because these guys unionized, they came back and says, we will not work unless you give us a path back to the source, right? All right. The second thing we need to understand about electricity, they are lazy. These electrons, they are lazy. See, she's smiling. She goes, how do you sit like men? Yes. <laughs> they do not want to do work for us, right? And they will take the path of least resistance, right? So they can either choose to go do work, or if they can find a shortcut or anything else, they'll take the path of least resistance. All right, so let's start putting this together. When our battery is low, what are we doing when we charge it? What are we actually doing to the battery? We're loading these electrons back in there, okay? Now, if we're going to a battery, is the battery making them, those electrons do work? Now, what is a battery, what do we know a battery for? What does it do for us? Stores. Stores electrical energy. All right, so put yourself in the shoes of an uh, electron, okay? You're sitting there, you have two different sources, because I said it can come from the alternator or it can come from shore power. These electrons are lazy. They don't want to do work, and they have an option. Hey, go over to this landing gear, go through this motor and provide power to this motor, and then we'll give you a path back or go over to this battery and hang out there for a while, okay? Now, what do you think the decision of those electrons are gonna be? The They're gonna go to the battery instead of go and do work because what do we know about electrons? Lazy. Lazy. Here's the situation, that battery is dead. When that battery is dead, the voltage is lower, okay? Now, typically I also go over, you know, just a couple things, but we understand that electrons are lazy. If they have the opportunity to go to a battery then a majority of the power that is coming in, both from our converter and from our alternator, goes to the battery. Leaves very little power left for us to do anything else. Okay, knowing that, what should we do, current situation? You've been driving all day, it is hot, you got swamp butt. You don't have a Ford that gives you air conditioned seats, you gotta dodge for whatever reason. You want to get inside and turn on the air conditioner. You got your landing gear down. It just touches the ground. You can't get anywhere. You can't get it off. Hey, I've got these you know, jumper cables that are eight foot long. I can't even jump off that battery. So what do you do? Knowing that all the electrons are going to that battery, what should we do? 
disconnect the battery. Take away the choice for those electrons. How many of you understand when you had kids, you gave the kids choice, and after a while you're like, why did I do that? Here's your only choice. <laughs> to do this. Yes, we take away the choice of these electrons. So we disconnect the battery. One last takeaway. You got an option. Do you disconnect the positive cable or the negative cable? Negative. What's that? Just turn the battery disconnect switch as though that's going to work. Here's the thing. All vendors are a little bit different. All OEMs are different. Do you think that battery disconnect will disconnect all flows of power to the battery? No. no. All right. You could try it. You can try it. It all depends. And each manufacturer is totally different. There's no one right way. Some of them, what we're doing is because, you know, our load to our landing gear and to our slide outs, far heavier than what a little ATC fuse can provide. So they do an inline, which they run that wire directly to the battery. Your disconnect may only go over to certain items. So it all depends. The best option, the laziest option, just disconnect the battery. The question is, is do we take off the positive terminal or the negative terminal? You're all saying negative as you know why. Why do we disconnect the negative when we're talking inside a chassis? So when it lights up the chassis all right, the most dangerous time when we're talking about you know, messing around with the battery is when we're either connecting or disconnecting. We're using a metal wrench and all we're doing is this right here, okay? Now, on our negative post to our battery, where is that cable going? To ground, to ground and on an RV, what is ground? The chassis. It's connected to the chassis. Now, I told you electrons, all they want to do is go back to the source. If I take that and put that on the positive, you know, take my little wrench and put it on the positive, and I begin to wrench, right? And I'm tired of just sit there just going very short strokes. So I said, you know what? I'm going to speed this up, and I go this way. And if I touch anything that is metal, that is touching the chassis, what happens? Right. All right. <laughs> Actually, just the exact opposite. Straight beard. <laughs> All right. Right. We have what's called a short, a dead short. You pee your pants a little bit, you know. You become a welder. <laughs> All the electrons, as many as possible, tries to go out. We call that a short. Now, what is short short for? Short cut. It's a short cut. Now, remember, understand that electrons are lazy. All they want to do is go to the source. If they can take a path back to the source without having to do work, do you think they'll take that path? And how many of those electrons, if they're stored, want to take that path? All of them, right? We overload and we actually melt or wrench whatever else there is. Because we're on the positive and we wrench over when we touch something that is negative. Now, we take that same situation and we put on the negative first and we begin to wrench. What happens whenever I'm on the negative post and I hit you know, the chassis, nothing. So rule of thumb, take the negative off first. Now, when you're on the positive, if you were to come over, if my, if my negative terminal is disconnected and I'm on the positive and I wrench too far and touch the chassis, what will happen? Nothing, all right? Cross your fingers, nothing. All right, so all we have to do is take off the battery, take off the negative on the battery. Once we do that, those electrons have no choice but to go do work for us, right? Here's the thing, that converter, it's actually called a converter charger. There's only so much power that it can produce out. If you ever get the opportunity to go look at your converter, you will find out whether you have a 45 amp, 50 amp, 55 amp, maybe 60 amp converter. 90% of those amps, if the battery is low, they're all gonna go to the battery. 90% of them will. There's not enough to perform the heavy loads. If I take away the option for those electrons to go to the battery, then they will all do the work for us. Now, once I get my landing gear down on my slides out, what should I do next? Reconnect the battery. Reconnect the battery, right? Let that converter be a charger, right? We, we call it a charger converter or converter charger. It's better to do one thing at a time than to try to do two things at once. Hey guys, this is a great class. I got to have some fun with uh, you Alliance RV owners. You made it super interesting. If this is something that you like, 
go ahead and consider coming over to the National RV Training Academy and signing up for a class or at least getting the home study where you get another 15, 20 hours with me. Oh, where are you going to find this stuff? Down here in the description. Just scroll down. It's right there.